Welcome back viewers to yet another lecture at CEC UGC. Hello everyone, I welcome you all to this lecture. My name is Piyush Chaudhary and I work as an assistant professor at the Department of English at Hansraj College, University of Delhi. The topic of our detailed discussion today will be the novel, the much acclaimed novel, A Suitable Boy by the much acclaimed and distinguished and I would say one of the most widely read contemporary writers of India, Vikram Seth. Now, um, it's, it's basically a massive novel, a massive novel spanning around 1500 pages. It is arguably one of the longest novels ever published in a single English language volume. The novel, A Suitable Boy, uh, it was first published in 1993 by uh, Phoenix House Publications in London, which was a massive single volume book. As you can see on the screen, this is the very first edition, the very first edition of Suitable Boy that you can see on the screen right now. Uh, and in the center you have the, the protagonist Lata. This is the first edition and it was a single volume edition way back in 1993. Now later on, later on this book was published in India by several other publishers like Penguin House, Aleph Books and now currently 30 years later, currently as we are speaking, currently in India the novel is published by Speaking Tree Publications in a three volume collector set which is easily available on any leading e-commerce site. I will show you the latest edition, this is the latest edition and I will be using the text like when I will be teaching the entire novel when I will be discussing the entire novel, its summary and, and its various detailed analysis, I will be using this edition, which is the latest edition available currently. Now, A Suitable Boy is much more than a, just a long singular narrative. This novel covers many of India's challenges as it gained independence in 1947 and in the early 1950s, including such as Hindu-Muslim tensions, land reforms, caste issues, communalism, to name a few. Now, the novel is set during a time of great change in India, just three years after gaining independence from the British rule. The novel is set in the early 1950s. Now, this entire huge 1500-page novel is divided into 19 separate sections. And each section, in the, in the latest edition, in the current edition, in the 30th anniversary edition, each section is introduced by a rhyming couplet on the contents page by Vikram Seth. Now, in short, I'll just first briefly discuss about the background to the, intro, uh, to the, to the suitable boy and then I'll go on to the detailed analysis and the summary of this huge novel. Now, this novel, a suitable boy, is about four families. First is the Mehras, then you have the Kapoors, the Chatterjees and the Khans. So, in these, within this broad space of four different families, the novel shows their friendships, their interconnected relationships and the problems and the tensions that go on between these four families. The novel is set in the post-independence period of 1947 up to the run-up to the general first general elections in India, which happened in the early 1950s. The book is set in India after its independence and partition and as I mentioned, it follows four families over 18 months set in the early 1950s as a mother, as a mother attempts to find a suitable boy for her daughter to marry. So the readers, the viewers by now would have got the idea that this is why the name of the novel is A Suitable Boy, as it is about the search for a suitable boy for Lata. Lata, Lata is the protagonist of the novel. Now, alongside its personal stories of domesticity, familial issues, the novel also explores various national political issues, leading up to the first post-independence election in 1952. Now, the novel also talks about caste dynamics, it talks about land reforms, it talks about zamindari system, which was prevalent way back in India in 1950s, it talks about agricultural life, it talks about communalism. It talks also about the intellectual and the academic life of Brahmapur. Now, Brahmapur, Brahmapur is the fictional town where most of the action of the novel is set. So, the story takes in a very broad historical context and accurately describes the historical reality of the times in which this novel was set, that is, in the early 1950s, right? So, Vikram Seth, he, he writes in a very detailed manner. I mean, of course, it's a 1500-page book, so he has written a lot. He writes in a very detailed manner 
and focuses on the meticulous details of everyday life, the everyday ceremonies, the domestic ceremonies, the domestic events, the emotions, Indian sensibilities, political happenings, village sensibilities, rural life. Thereby, thereby he creates what can be called a whole panoramic view, a panoramic view of the Indian life in the early 1950s. Now, Seth originally, he, he took a long time in writing this novel. He wrote this novel in a period of almost eight years when he was in India, when he came back to India. And this was after the publication of his first novel, which is The Golden Gate, which is in, in fact a novel in verse. So it's a novel, but written in verse, in poetic couplets and in poetic rhymes. And A Suitable Boy, as a novel, has often been compared to several of the 18th century British novelists like Jane Austen or even George Eliot for that matter. So when you, when you read The Suitable Boy and if you compare that to say Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, a lot of what happens in A Suitable Boy is seen there in, in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice as well. I am not saying that uh, Vikram Seth has taken the entire idea from Pride and Prejudice but there are certain similarities between the two novels and the two novelists also. Why? This is simply because all these writers, whether it be Vikram Seth or it be Jane Austen or even George Eliot for that matter, all these writers have attempted to show a huge panoramic view of society in their own ways. And all these novelists, particularly Vikram Seth, is preoccupied with several themes related to domesticity and marriage. So the protagonist, if we, if we talk about the protagonist of the novel, uh, she is Lata. Uh, Lata is a 19 year old college student who is pursuing a degree in English literature from a university at Brahmapur and she has to choose between three boys. The first boy is Kabir, a dashing Muslim man, a dashing Muslim cricketer. He is the first love of Lata. Then you have Harish who is a shoemaker, who is a shoemaker, a self-made man who has made his way up into the world on his own. And then the third one is Amit. Amit is a poet, he is an intellectual novelist and a member of the famous Chatterjee cast and the famous Chatterjee family of Kolkata. Now Lata's story centers around these three men and how she makes this difficult choice between Amit, Kabir and Harish. And all this while, all this while she must make this difficult choice between these three men while resisting the pressure from her strong-willed mother, Mrs. Rupa Mehra, and also her highly opinionated brother, Arun Mehra. But at the end, at the end, Lata makes her own decision and opts for the boy which is most suitable for her. But she does that in, in, in a very independent manner. So the novel shows how Lata manages to find her way between the three young men who are all her admirers. And the novel also shows, interestingly, how society also judges whom we marry and how society influences our personal choices as well. Now, if, if I can say so, A Suitable Boy is basically a, a carving on the ivory, I would say. It's a, it's a whole world, it's a whole panoramic world as I've mentioned repeatedly that Vikram Seth has constructed. The immediate, social, emotional, intellectual world that is inhabited by all these characters in The Suitable Boy, they remain grounded in, in, you can say, the bygone era of the post-independence times in North India. It is also interesting to note that the novel works more on the individual level rather than on the political or the social level. Vikram Seth talks about the individual aspects, talks about marriage and the institution of marriage. He talks about the various hundreds of characters that are there in the novel, but he also talks about the political level, the social level of the early 1950s in which the novel was set. But, but, it is interesting to note that his work, particularly A Suitable Boy, is, is, is very, it's, it's very strong at the individual level. Why so? Because, you know, the world that is inhabited by the characters, the, the story, the subplots of this, of this novel, the entire, the conversations are very intimate. There is a level of intimacy that is present uh, between the various characters. And this makes this particular novel, A Suitable Boy, a very acute reading of the human mind, of the human emotions and the human heart. So the novel's scope and depth makes it one of the most monumental works in Indian literature today. 
offering a rich exploration of a nation in turmoil and in transition and also the personal lives of those that are living in that nation. The novel's depth and the scope makes it a monumental work that captures the essence of an era while telling a very, very deeply, a very deeply human story. Okay, so this was basically the, 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 uh, the uh, detailed summary of, of uh, the, de the introduction to A Suitable Boy. Now I will, first and foremost, I will begin with a very detailed summary of this massive novel. Uh, since this is the first part of my lecture on Suitable Boy and I will be uh, conducting several other parts, two or three more parts on this novel, I will be completing the first half of the novel today. So what I will be doing is, I will be completing the first nine or ten parts of this novel and the remaining nine or ten parts in the subsequent lectures to follow. So this will be a, a three or a four lecture series on A Suitable Boy. So let us now begin with uh, a summary of the suitable boy and uh, right now as you can see I will be uh, you know only focusing on part 1 to 10 right so I will go further now. So since this is an extremely huge novel so just a disclaimer before I begin the detailed analysis since it is an extremely huge novel with its original version spanning as much as 1500 pages therefore the next few parts will be just about summarizing the various parts of this novel. So we know that there are 19 parts in this novel. Therefore, this particular session, this lecture that you are watching on a summary of Suitable Boy will be completed in two parts. So what I what will be doing is that I will be narrating the summary of this novel part by part and in each single part, I have focused only on those aspects which are important to the novel as a whole. Right? A detailed character analysis of the various characters and a thematic understanding of the same will be dealt with in, in subsequent parts and I will be taking up those points later on. So therefore, in presenting a summary of this massive novel, I may have missed a lot of details which I believe a reader of this beautiful novel must not. So this summary, however, is just an aid, just a supplement to this novel and I believe that in no way should it be taken as a substitute of the original novel. Because the felicity of language, the deep insights into the human character and, and uh, I would say the almost quasi-historical realistic depiction of the socio-political lives in the 1950s is missing from this summary. Therefore, I would urge all the readers and students of literature and the viewers to read this massive novel page by page and use this summary only as a reference point, as a supplement. And on this note, I will now finally begin with part 1 of the novel. And now you can see this is part 1 and I am beginning uh, from part 1 from this point onwards. Now, the novel begins with the wedding of Pran Kapoor and Savita Mehra. Right at the very beginning of the novel, we see Mrs. Rupa Mehra informing her daughter Lata that she too will marry the boy that she chooses. The very first lines of the novels begin like that. This means that Savita also married the boy that Mrs. Rupa Mehra chose for her. So, the first lines of the novel mentions this. Then, as the, as, as the first part progresses, we are introduced to almost all the major characters of the Kapoor family and the Mehra family. We are introduced to Pran Kapoor's father, Mahesh Kapoor, uh, who, as we know, is a revenue minister of Purva Pradesh. Uh, Purva Pradesh is basically the modern equivalent of the parts of the Gangetic Plain, the uh, Hindi belt of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. But Seth has given a fictional name titled Purva Pradesh, that is the eastern state, the province where the novel is majorly set. So the revenue minister Mr. Mahesh Kapoor is introduced as an ideal man, as an honest politician who has great morals but whose younger son Man Kapoor is a careless and a laid back young man, he is a wastrel, he has no plans of settling down, he is extremely, um, you know, you know he is very unserious about his life, he's, he wastes his time in doing idle things and, it, and basically Man Kapoor is a stark contrast to his own father. We are told in this part that the wedding is inhabited by several important people and it is clear that it is the wedding of the upper middle class society. Then as the first part progresses, we are then introduced to Meenakshi Chatterjee who is the daughter-in-law of Mrs. Mehra and Arun Mehra who is the elder son. Arun Mehra is the elder son of Mrs. Rupa Mehra. Meenakshi then is his bold fl flamboyant modern, his wife, his, his bold flamboyant modern wife and she dresses very boldly. She carries herself with a certain sense of superiority 
and she is much to the dismay of her uh, mother-in-law. She is often dismissive of his mother-in-law. Arun, on the other hand, is a modern British bred man who dislikes Indian customs, he dislikes Indian culture and he considers himself as a Britisher. He thinks that anything which is Swadeshi is of low class and he hates everything Swadeshi. He prefers a foreign British bred life over the Indians. We are then introduced to Varun Mehra who is the younger brother of Arun Mehra and uh, he is a very timid boy, a very shy character. Now Arun, the elder brother, he values the pomp and show of aristocratic families while the younger brother Varun, he prefers everything Swadeshi. And finally the wedding ceremony concludes and Savita is married to Pran Kapoor but this time much to the dismay of Lata. Lata is disappointed with this marriage while Savita on the other hand shows no signs of reluctance or regret, she is perfectly fine with it. Lata does not like the concept of arranged marriages and wonder how her sister Savita agreed to marry the man Pran Kapoor in just one meeting on the suggestion of her mother. Then as first part progresses, we are also informed that Lata's grandfather, Dr. Kishan Chand Set, has not attended the wedding, possibly because he was not consulted about fixing the marriage of Savita. Then we are introduced to the family of the Khans, the Nawab of Baitar uh, and his family. The Nawab of Baitar has two sons, Feroz and Imtiaz, uh, who are a lawyer and a, and, a, and a doctor respectively. We are also informed that the Nawab's family has moved to Pakistan during the partition which happened just a few years below before the novel begins. However, he and his sons have stayed here in Purva Pradesh in Hindustan. Now, as part one progresses, Lata, after seeing the arranged marriage of her elder sister Savita with Pran Kapoor, says that she does not want to get married. Now, Lata says that and this statement had a very, very disturbing effect on her mother, Mrs. Rupa Mehra. Rather, I would say this had a contrary effect on Mrs. Rupa Mehra as right from this point onwards, she gets going into the process of getting her younger daughter Lata married as soon as possible to a suitable boy of her choice. Whose choice? The mother's choice. So we are then next introduced to Malati. Malati is again Lata's, uh, she is basically Lata's best friend in college and uh, Malati is a contrast to Lata because uh, Lata is not a very outgoing girl, not a very adventurous girl. But Malti, on the other hand, is a very outgoing girl. She is an adventurous girl and she provides a stark contrast to the more traditional, soft-natured and I would say contemplative Lata. And very soon, Mrs. Rupa Mehra writes a letter to three people to arrange and look for suitable boys for Lata. The first person that she writes to is her father, Dr. Kishan Chanset. Then the second letter that Mrs. Rupa Mehra writes to is uh, to her elder brother, to, to her elder son uh, Arun, Arun Mehra. And then she writes another letter to her friend, to her younger friend, Kalpna Gaur. Kalpna is basically a close friend of the Mehras and uh, Kalpna Gaur lives in Delhi. So Rupa Mehra writes the third letter to Kalpna Gaur. And she writes all these letters to ask them to find a suitable boy for Lata. Then as the novel progresses, then in part 1.15, in part 1.15 of the novel, we notice the first encounter of Lata and Kabir. And it is clear from their encounter and from their very first conversation that Kabir likes Lata and Lata also in turn likes him. However, this is a very beginning of their friendship which has not yet fully developed into a full-fledged love affair as of now. That, that happens, that happens in the later parts of the novel, that happens in as the novel progresses. Then further in part 1.19, Meenakshi, the, the daughter-in-law of Rupa Mehra, decides to melt the gold medals that were given to her husband Arun after the wedding. And when finally the news reaches the Mehra household, Mrs. Rupa Mehra bursts into tears. Those gold medals were the gold medals that Mrs. Rupa Mehra's husband, Mr. late Mr. Raghubir Mehra had got in his, in his uh, you know, when, when he was a young college going student. And Meenakshi melted those gold medals to make earrings out of that. So it is clear, you know, as the novel progresses, I'll also be giving you a detailed character analysis later on. But through this summary, this summary makes, you know, it, uh, there are two benefits of this summary. 
because you know as we go on the summary i'll be also giving my critical points and commentaries on the various characters and when later on i come into the character analysis so definitely i'll be going on into the character analysis at that time but from the summary also we get to know a lot about the various characters right because it's it's you know so it is clear that minakshi uh, minakshi has little or i would say no emotional values for her late father in law's personal collection for her these souvenirs do not matter much and therefore she represents and basically minakshi represents in the novel she represents a more forward looking a more modern you know a more modern mo mindset with little or no regard perhaps no regard for traditional values cultures and outlooks now the first part of the novel ends at this point of time uh, almost all the major characters in the novel be it from the kapoor family or the nawab the khan family or uh, you know the mehras and even chatter not not much of chatter ji but most of the major characters most of the major characters uh, they are introduced in part 1 of this novel and uh, part 1 also shows the you know it it shows the hustle bustle the of everyday life at brahmapur and as we know brahmapur is the fictional town of purva pradesh which is again a fictional state in india and uh, part 1 also shows us a marriage it shows us various families it shows us the huge plethora of characters it shows us the political conflicts between the nawab and mahesh kapoor and also tells us about the doomed love affair of some characters like lata and kabir so now i'll go on as you can see on the slide uh, i'll i'll be going to part 2 from uh, part 1 has been done now i'll be going to part 2 of this novel now part 2 of the novel begins with uh, it begins with the hindu festival of holi which is being celebrated in the household of kapoor's and uh, mr mahesh kapoor has organized a holi concert on the evening of on the evening of holi and he has invited saida bai saida bai firozabadi the famous ghazal singer singer and courtesan she was a very popular ghazal singer this woman saida bai whose fame has spread much beyond brahmapur she is very famous for her beautiful ghazal singing and also she is famous for her profession as a courtesan who entertains only the rich aristocracy of brahmapur with sexual favors in the concert she comes with her accompanying players and you know her her musicians and she sings ghazal man kapoor as soon as he hears and he sees uh, saeed abai firoz abadi he instantly is attracted to her to her voice and to her looks finally in part 2.5 she sings the the much famous ghazal by amir minai and this is the ghazal by amir minai as you can see on the screen mehfil barkast hui patange ruksat shamao se ho rahe hain hai kuch ka waqt aasman par tare kahi naam ko rahe hain now this ghazal as you can see i mean i've also given the translation that is there by vikram said the ghazal gets translated as the meeting has dispersed the moths bit farewell to the candlelight departures are is on the sky only a few stars mark the night so you see this is vikram said's translation from the suitable boy now what is that what is the theme of this this ghazal that we just saw it's basically departure and then this reference to mehfil barkhast is a reference to the ghazal singing finally coming to its end and with this she asks for her driver to drop her off to her house as the mehfil the gathering finally comes to an end but with the end of this gathering begins the extreme and i would say uh, i can say dangerously obsessive love affair of man and saida bai man as we know is is totally infatuated by the beauty of saida bai right when he sees her for the very first moment and also her singing then in part 2.12 we are informed that the raja of mard he was a local he was a local royal prince the raja of mard he was building a temple next to a mosque in brahmapur we are also informed about saida bai's two musicians ishaq khan and motu chand ishaq khan was a sarangi player and motu chand was a tabla player in the next part that is part 2.13 man finally comes to saida bai's house to see her saida bai refers to man as dag sahab a reference to dag dehlvi the famous delhi based urdu ghazal writer then very soon the son of the nawab firoz who is also the best friend of man kapoor comes to saida bai's house and is instantly attracted to tasneem who is the sister of saida bai 
Then in part 2.18, we get to know that Saida Bai also has started to develop feelings for Man Kapoor. And then in 2.19, Man comes with the book of Ghazals and gifts it to Saida Bai, but he was not allowed to meet her because Saida Bai was entertaining the Raja of Mar. But he gifts her the book of Ghazals and she is deeply touched with it and she starts falling in love with him more. Next is part 3 of the novel. Now, part 3 begins with Savita and Pran. They were both playing a prank on Mrs. Rupa Mehra, telling her that Lata has eloped with Man Kapoor. Then in part 3.13, once again she meets Kabir and they sit on the bench at the university and they talk their hearts out. Then in part 3.10 of the novel, Lata is informed by her friend Malti that Kabir's last name is Durani and therefore she should not think about anything serious with him. And right from this moment onward, Lata realizes that she will not be able to succeed in convincing her family to marry Kabir because he was a Muslim. From part 3.12 to part 3.14, we see the scenes which are full of romantic love and light passionate moments between Lata and Kabir as they go to visit Barsat Mahal, which is a beautiful monument in Brahmapur. Later on, when Lata returns home, she is unsettled by the thought of Kabir being a Muslim. Finally, Savita notices the change in her behavior and she is able to, you know, make her confess everything and Savita is able to get all the details and informs her and warns her in a subtle way that she should not think much about Kabir Durani. Then in uh, part 3.18, uh, the final confrontation scene between Mrs. Rupa Mehra and Lata. Mrs. Rupa Mehra gets to know from other women that Lata was seen with a boy and then she confronts him and upon knowing that Kabir is a Muslim, she is terrified, she slaps Lata and herself starts crying in pain. Very soon, she decides to leave Brahmapur because of Kabir and visits Calcutta to find a suitable boy for Lata. From here onwards, the hunt for a suitable boy becomes very intense. And then they meet, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kabir understanding that, you know, in 3.20, Kabir meets Lata and then realizes that Lata asks her to elope with him. But Kabir simply refuses. Lata thinks that she does not, he does not love her and then the third part of the novel ends with the mother and the daughter leaving Brahmapur for Calcutta as the mother finds that it is the best place to find a suitable groom for her. Then the last part of the novel, the readers are introduced to Harish Khanna who as we know is the, as the novel progresses is the third prospect for Lata. The first prospect is Kabir, then it's Amit and the third is Harish Khanna who works at CLFC which is Kanpur Leather and Footwear Company where he is a professional shoemaker. Part 4 also talks about the effects of partition and the memory of partition which is still afresh in the residents of Brahmapur. So I will end the lecture at this point of time. We have completed the first four parts of this huge novel. We will begin with part 5 of the novel in a short while in the next lecture. Thank you so much.